Bueno, compañeras, compañeros, queremos darles la bienvenida, agradecerles por la presencia a quienes están acá de forma presencial y también. Hello everyone. We want to greet to you all, um, all of those who are here and those who are watching online. live in this international seminar in which we are going to discuss and talk about the, the conclusions of the first Pan-African Pan Congress of the, of the ISL, of the International Socialist League, and, and the our perspective and the challenges that we find after we having met met revolutionary other revolutionary comrades from, from Africa. Continent. So I don't want to make you wait ado, anymore, I want to so I would like to introduce you to our different comrades. We are going to listen to their reports. From our First of Alejandro Bodart, part of the leadership of the ISL and of Argentinian MST. Um, Ezra, we already know already him know from Kenya, and, and then from two, two other comrades, Esther, Esther from and Venice, Ghana, Esther from and Ghana, Venezia and from Malawi. Venezia so from big applause for Sim the comrades, and we'll Simbabwe. begin with the presentation. So let's begin with the um, reports. Now, yes, to begin, I'll give the... Alejandro, you can go ahead. Alejandro Bodar. Well, good afternoon to everyone. Many of you surely have read some of the texts that were produced by this event that we held in August in Nairobi, Kenya. This event was the product of one of the main uh, conclusions of the World Congress of the ISL as a conclusion that we have reached mainly with the comrades of Kenya who joined the ISL in the first Congress of the ISL that we held in Buenos Aires, uh, which they weren't able to attend because traveling from Africa to Argentina was complicated, but we developed a relationship since that period, since that moment, and we reached a characterization which is uh, in Africa, similar to many other places, but in Africa there is certainly a huge vacuum in from the perspective, there's a huge vacuum in terms of the organizations of the left. Because Stalinism, which had a huge strength after World War II, because one way or another it was involved in the struggles for independence from the European powers, it, Stalinism played an important role. They were involved in what came afterwards with the independence, helping to transform countries into semi-colonies. But since the 1990s, the collapse of Stalinism and the transformation of Russia and China into capitalist countries, which evolved into becoming imperialist powers, some of them more regionally, other more globally, but they play a role in Africa, not at the head of any struggles, but the opposite. China is the main commercial partner of Africa, like many other places. The Chinese businesses use the cheap labor force. And there was what, the, what is left of the communist parties, of the Stalinist parties, is a pro-China and posing China as an alternative to Western capitalism. Russia also plays a role with 
The Wagner Group, for example, plays a direct role in many places in the coups that there have been or in supporting some governments. So many people that were with the communist parties at some point broke with the communist parties because of these things. Our comrades come from there, for example. They began as the, Cuban t as the youth of the communist party and precisely because of the discussion over China, they began to break with the communist party and evolve towards uh, the unity we have achieved. And it's a process that is not just in Kenya. We saw that it was a more global process. So in our World Congress, we said, let's let's attempt a call and see with whom we uh, converge. If we invite to an event where we can begin to discuss the possibility of organizing the international in Africa in a very audacious way. In just a few months, we built this event. As you have read, we were able to get organizations from 14 countries of Africa to participate. And some were not able to travel because of some problems with comrades from South Africa it did not get the visas on time to travel, for example. Others almost didn't travel because of visa problems as well. But the meeting itself and the fact that the call we made from the ISL together with the Kenyan comrades that 14 countries participated is a confirmation of the space that we see that exists. So it opens a huge challenge because we held the first meeting, but this is the beginning of something. We are deepening the relations with the comrades that came and participated. We voted a materially manifesto that was pretty advanced politically, which shows how there is a shift of many organizations that have had contact with some reformist organizations or Stalinist ones or youth organizations that don't have uh, or women's organizations like comrades will, will tell and I'll talk about the situation of women in Africa, which is problems that are far superior to uh, problems women have in, in the West. But with all these comrades, we held this first meeting, which discussed three or four very important issues. Many of you saw uh, some of this in the materials we had from our Congress. And we've uh, contributed even with other uh, currents since we began to organize uh, with Africa. Many other organizations uh, began to write about Pan-Africanism, which, uh, you know, they had never uh, written about before. So these debates are important. I'm not going to get into the most important debate because Africa today is going through a very important process, but Ezra is going to develop that much better than I could. But it has to do with a process of rebellion in sub-Saharan Africa, in the Sahel, which was a French colonies, and there's rebellions one country after another to get rid of the French dominion. There's already five countries, because in 2021, there was a, a rebellion in Guinea, and then in Burkina Faso, Mali in 2022, sorry. And this year in 2023 is Niger, which be, became far more well known because of a important detail which has they have the uranium and 
with the energy crisis in France with the problem with Russia uh, that cut off you know the gas and France depends a lot on nuclear power so it's another process in which governments fell that were very submissive to French imperialism we have to know that the semi-colonizations has some colonial elements so in France for example the the French uh, currency is the currency of some of these places they don't have their own central bank because uh, it's in it's in Europe and so the economy is is held from over there so there's a free market that's not free at all it's for the multinationals and the french multinationals too for example niger is one of the poorest countries of africa dictatorial governments with 40 40 years in power military bases that control and there's been a process of rebellion this was an important debate because the, the sectors that headed them were sectors of the army. That's why in the West, they, there's talk all, only of coups and, you know, reactionary coups, etc. Now, the sectors of the army did this to channel a rebellion that was happening to so that it not advance where it could have gone though they have to take some measures that are, are that are progressive that are positive like breaking with france and some democratic and social measures so one important debate that we had many expectations because between our world congress and the in the pan-african congress this process was very strong. So part of the debate is, is there a new nationalism rising with this, which can become an obstacle for socialist organizations that come from breaks from the Communist Party or places can be uh, absorbed by this nationalist process, which is linked to Russia and China. The truth is, we were surprised because the experience of Africa and the military putting themselves at the head of processes to stop processes it is, is so well known already. And so in the Congress, it, almost everyone had clarity that these new military nationalists are at the head of processes that are a mass movement, but we can't trust those uh, those military leaderships. And it's, you know, it's, it would be difficult, a kind of nationalism like Chavez in, which today is not much of an example, but this was an important debate. For us, it was very important to know how the meeting would uh, position itself in relation to this process. And Africa, you should know that from 2008, with the beginning of the great capitalist crisis, the main processes began in Africa. The, the famous uh, Arab Spring, which exploded in, in another region of Africa, northern Africa, which is, you know, facing Europe and the Middle East, but those revolutionary processes were tremendous. And that, that north of Africa, together with South Africa, is the places where there's more industry and, and industrial class. But that, those processes retreated. But the situation did not go back to being the same. The Saharawi process, for example, was reawakened, which was part of that process as well. 
we began to organize in Western Sahara from that reactivation. That is what led us to connect with the comrades that are in the ISL now from Western Sahara, whose Chaya participated in, in, the, in the meeting as well. So Africa, which is very little known by Trotskyism and the revolutionary left, has protagonized important rebellions, and there begins to be a young vanguard. Because then you can ask you know, Ezra now how old the comrades are. When, and none, none of them are 30 years old. It's a, it's, a, it's a young continent, young vanguard that is looking for alternatives. And so I think the possibilities for the ISL are huge. The, the limitations are our own in what we are able to do to help develop this process. It doesn't mean it's easy. As you can say, the apparatuses are weak. There is uh, elements of a vacuum. There is a vanguard that is looking. That doesn't mean there isn't competition. In Africa, for example, I think in Africa, imperialism, who re realize these opportunities before we do, and though there is a network of corruption through NGOs that is a permanent competitor for what we do because with with money they they organize and they corrupt and and it is one of the main obstacles and competitors we have in terms of organizing the vanguard so how we how the revolutionary left can be strengthened instead of them. Another important debate was Pan-Africanism. Because in Africa, there is a historic demand for unifying a nation that was carved up by imperialism. And so there is a very strong sentiment for the unification which it doesn't limit itself to uh, the population in Africa, but includes as well the diaspora. For example, the Haitian comrades uh, participated as well. Brazil were comrades there participated as well. And with phenomenons that developed in the United States, as there is a general uh, idea of the struggle for the unity of Africa. Now, there is a debate on how does that unity take place, because the bourgeoisie uses this to for a unity of Africans without class, without class divisions. <laughs> Some will uh, pose this unity in terms of uh, ethnicity of blacks uh, against uh, whites and it glosses over that the governments and the um, entrepreneurs and everything that are applying the semi-colonial uh, policies are black as well. We have to, we've discussed this for some time, uh, getting to know it with the comrades from Kenya, but it's important, the struggle for a revolutionary pan-Africanism linked to socialism and that the only uh, unity of Africa that is possible is uh, defeating imperialism and it's going against capitalism. And for that, the only road is uh, socialism. And above all, on the basis of Marxism. And this is an important debate. And it's a debate that around which there was unity in the meeting, which shows there is a vanguard that has clarity on these debates, debates that we need to write about more. Ezra always says, I think he... He, he 
uh, said this before at some talk here in, in one of uh, my trips to uh, Africa in Nairobi. You know, this debate was there where I went. Oh, they were respectful with me, but some, you know, some of them were saying, what's this white guy doing here? And they, the comrades correctly gave a debate that, you know, our path forward is based on class unity. But these are important debates. And to have a current uh, that fights for these ideas is very important. Uh, the debates that happen all over the world are part of the debates there. So what our last magazine, the debate on the imperialist hegemony, is obviously a debate in Africa as well. What is happening in Western Africa with France is part of this debate. Because France is commanded by the United States as part of that imperialist bloc, and it's part of the dispute for, for hegemony today. And so this it plays out there with the interference of Russia and China, China economically. Africa is one of the first places where they developed the New Silk Road of China attempting to advance, uh, taking over first commercially, but advancing towards a more imperialist dominion. So the debate essentially is not if, if the coups are progressive or not, but if getting rid of these imperialists should be for another imperialist to come replace them or not. These are the same Wagner group that is, you know, fighting in, in Ukraine, which play the role of the of army in many places. So an important debate is how do we get rid of France, England, etc., but not without falling into an, a new imperialism. It's going to be well, it's another important debate that will be in the new magazine we are preparing. I'm going to let the... the the comrades speak because it's more important that you can hear them. But the Congress discussed the problems of women, of course. If you saw the photographs of the of the event, you, you'll see there was more women than men at the meeting. This has to do with, that is where you, you can see clearly the double exploitation, the triple exploitation in entire zones where there is a semi-feudal, semi-medieval uh, situation in women's oppression. And that leads sector of women, especially young women, are an important part of the vanguard. You'll hear them. Both comrades are specialists in, in this issue. They'll, they'll, they'll talk about it. Another important debate was the relation with the of the aggression against nature and the problems in Africa. There's a direct um, link with uh, survival because it's an economy mainly um, agrarian with very small industry and a lot of agriculture is subsistence farming and the advance of uh, cash crops are are uh, hurting people's possibility of uh, growing their food and surviving so there's a unification of the program with the particularities in each place, but so some of the problems that we see internationally in Africa have a much superior development, which leads to campaigns. We have comrades have the, the Jao revolution, the hunger uh, revolution campaign, which are important to socialize to 
transmit to the Vanguard. Nosotros nos hemos dado una una hoja de ruta a partir del Congreso. We have uh, set a path forward from the Congress, which is how do we advance quickly with the building of organiza revolutionary organizations in each country where we can be. So we have before us the necessity of traveling. We're thinking if before the end of the year we can travel to Ghana it, with to with Guinea. We're in a conversation now with comrades from Togo. You'll, you'll hear now from the comrades from Ghana and Malawi. But it's a challenge for us and mainly for our comrades of Kenya who are the ones who organize this. And we, you know, we were hoping, you know, four or five uh, from four or five countries coming. And when it became much bigger, very fast, uh, is something that's going to need a lot of support from the international. Another complication, she knows that the, not everyone speaks the same languages because, you know, uh, French colonies, it's French and they don't speak English. And there's obviously African languages as well. One of the programmatic points that the the comrades raise is how do we uh, recover uh, our local languages and against the colonial ones. And we can only advance in this with collaboration of the international and international organization. And I'll finish with this. At the same time, we have the challenge in the ISL of developing our organization in Eastern Europe, where, for example, in Ukraine, our group in Ukraine, for example, which in the middle of the war has raised contradictions to new extremes. There's a reactionary repression where Russia controls the territory, generates a tremendous polarization with sectors of the vanguard, which raise uh, many challenges for us. A lot of the vanguard there is in exile, which demands us how do we make campaigns to impact inside Ukraine. We also have in December a meeting in Central America where there's organizations who have come from our current and have brought together a comrades from organizations from various countries in Central America. And so the Costa Rican comrades joined the organization. Comrades from Mexico just joined. We have the Haitian comrades that are joining. So we, we have a we have a tremendous pressure to organize a regional center of the ISL in Central America to attend to all this, which can include Mexico again. So the ISL in a short time has become a tool for regroupment that practically has no limits. I'll finish with this. What we're seeing in Africa is not only in Africa. It has to do with the new world we're in. It's a polarized world which has one face on the right, which shows its teeth, which is part of all the great crises of capitalism. In every crisis of capitalism, there was expressions of far of the far right, but it also has another face, which is the deterioration of the traditional leaderships, which opened the possibility of opening space for building the revolutionary left. For example, there was a, a meeting was held in Milan, which brought together almost all of the revolutionary left of Europe. That allowed us to con contact people from Germany, 
which want us to go there as well. So there's processes everywhere of all kinds. So this is, it's, it's a lot for us to, to handle. So it's a, you know, it's a welcome problem, but it's going to need a lot of support. But also, especially the new generations in a country where people, you know, are very Latin America centered. We need young comrades to learn languages to, you know, we're going to need young comrades to take up the challenge of building in another country. This helps having a it, it, an exchange of comrades with different countries. The Australian comrades uh, want to have an exchange to have a comrade of theirs spend some months here and Argentinian comrade there, not, but uh, need to speak English. So we have a, and now the, the challenge is not, is of all of us. The challenge is not for those of us dedicated to building the international. It's a challenge for the whole party. It's about challenge for all, all you comrades to take it up as part of your challenge. And the party has to be at the service of this challenge. And betting on building the international is not weakening the Argentinian party. On the contrary, the, the, the development of the ISL has strengthened the Argentinian party and it has strengthened every group that the I, is part of the ISL. And so it allows the international to support the our different sections but it involves young comrades having these experiences remember everyone what, when the russian revolution happened lenin and trotsky had to run there because they were in exile in europe and new york because internationalism has always been a fundamental part of what we're doing something to learn from the comrades is we also have means to help because we have an accumulation of many years of uh, building revolution organizations which collaborate with uh, groups in africa and all around the world to develop okay so now ezra is going to give a presentation which is going to be in English, but here you will hear the Spanish translation. Then Esther will, from Ghana, will give a presentation, and then Venecia from Malawi will give her presentation. De de Erra, y después unos 15 minutos y 15 minutos de las compañeras. Ezra will speak about 20 minutes, and the comrades maybe about 15 each. So they, all, so they have 30 minutes, Ezra, 20, about to have a, a guide. And then we'll have questions, and then we'll have closing statements by each of the comrades to address the questions that may be raised. So, Ezra, you're up. Buenas, comrades. I hope you guys are hearing me fine. Uh, so, uh, Alejandro has spoken much about uh, uh, what he experienced in Africa, what he, you know, what, what the Pan African Congress meant to the International Socialist League. And just to piggyback on what he said, uh, we are very, very, very happy with what went on the Pan-African Congress. And this is a very, very important step in building the International Socialist League in Africa. Uh, I, however, speak uh, very briefly about uh, what is going on in Africa now, because uh, it is very important if uh, all comrades understand what's been going on uh, since uh, the, the late 2019 to 2020, 2021, 2022, uh, until now, it's a culmination of what has been coming all along and what will be coming in the near future and the far future in Africa. As uh, uh, when I come to when I came to Argentina uh, last year, I talked about Africa 
most states in Africa being very, very new states uh, where uh, most countries have less than 60 years of independence because uh, most of them gained their independence in the 1960s from mainly from the British, the French, and the Portuguese. So uh, as we talked about neocolonialism, it has been a very, very uh, important topic because uh, foreign countries, uh, these colonial states didn't really leave Africa, but they installed their stooges to uh, rule and control over the people of Africa, especially the French comrades, who the, the French countries, sorry, who uh, the French had a very, very uh, distinct way of coloni colonizing called the divide and rule whereby the uh, and, uh, assimilation method, whereby they wanted their people to be uh, more like themselves and French people. Uh, this was to make them uh, unaware of the atrocities that they continue to uh, operate in their uh, mineral, mineral rich uh, continent of Africa. I also talked about when I was in Argentina, uh, the vastness of minerals and the richness of the lands in Africa. Countries like uh, Mali, where there was a coup, countries in Niger, where Alejandro talked about. Uh, there's a country called the Congo, which is actually one of the main countries and has a lot of uh, minerals, uh, is uh, facing uh, this same, same kind of problem. But uh, uh, let me start by what happened in July. For those who uh, didn't get a chance to uh, to to read uh, the text that we discussed uh, in the Congress. Uh, in July 26, there was a very, very uh, important coup in Niger where the uh, uh, Bozum, the president of Niger, was dethroned, uh, you know, by the military of uh, Tiani. But, uh, you know, this was a very, very big step for the people of Africa. It was met with applause all over Africa because it has been a long time coming because uh, uh, Chad, for example, Niger, Mali are one of the poorest countries in the world. But, uh, you know, comparing the minerals that they have, this is a very, very uh, uh, atrocious thing to do. And uh, it has been something that has been brewing. And with this age of information, anger has brewed enough that the people decided to stand up, the, the military has decided to stand up really. The difference between uh, the initial military coups and this military coups is that this uh, these coups that are happening in Africa now are people backed. Uh, whether they are revolutionary or not, we have to accept that the people are very, very uh, much for these military juntas because uh, they are very active. They are very hungry, hungry for change. All we can say is that the objective conditions for a revolution in Africa is very, very ripe. But the subjective conditions, uh, including the uh, tri tribalism in uh, some countries that is used to divide the people, you know, racism in some countries that is used to divide the people, are the ones that are keeping these uh, imperialists uh, in, in power. For example, uh, what happened in Niger was very, very important because it triggered a coup in Gabon, uh, which was very coincidental because it the coup in Gabon uh, happened when we uh, were going on with the Congress, actually. Uh, uh, that coup was not very, very uh, 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 left-leaning and pro-people, as it said, because uh, Omar, Omar Bongo and Ali Bongo have been ruling the country for over 45 to 50 years. And they just insult their cousin, who is uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, working towards the people. But, uh, you know, these French stooges are being ejected in their countries. Uh, of course, there's still a very long way to go because uh, countries like Burkina Faso, countries like, uh, like Cote d'Ivoire, uh, still are very, very pro-Western. And uh, these countries are still... Uh, the main uh, uh, frontiers of the Western imperialism, like Nigeria, uh, the president of Ghana, Esther can add that later, the president of uh, uh, Ivory Coast, 
in East Africa here, the president of Kenya is very, very pro-West. You've seen, you've, I, I'm sure you've all heard of what is done in Haiti. He just uh, two days ago, uh, the UN passed the resolution that Kenya will be sending their troops to Haiti, uh, you know, to fight a proxy war, you know, the United States war, which we strongly and strongly and vehemently condemn this kind of act. Uh, but let me go back to uh, the minerals vis-a-vis -vis the uh, indirect rule of the imperialism in Africa. Uh, in Congo, for example, there is a, a very, very um, dangerous and, and uh, well-armed group called M23, which is uh, taking control of several parts of the Congo, which are very strategic uh, with regard to the minerals that are there. These uh, machinery groups are being funded by the uh, Western capitalists, uh, the US and uh, the EU, uh, to uh, uh, maintain the control of uh, mining of cobalt, which is very important uh, in uh, in making of phones and other electronic accessories. So the Kenyan army, the Kenyan army also was sent there to, you know, in the peacekeeping missions, just like they have been sent in Haiti. So Kenya is one of the retrogressive states that is being used by the uh, by the imperialists to continue with the uh, repressive rules and, uh, and confusions among this, uh, amongst the people. Uh, the divide and rule is being seen because uh, the people also have to choose sides. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, people of, uh, of Niger, for example, recently have had to, there was a, a very uh, soon last week, there was a thwarted coup uh, from uh, one of the factions of the military in uh, Niger to try and overthrow this uh, uh, the military junta that was installed in July. But uh, this, of course, is being uh, funded as uh, reports came uh, from media outlets. They are be they were being funded uh, by you know France and uh, and uh, you know the EU and the US. You understand that. Uh, 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 the main reason uh, the Niger coup was a uh, uh, big hit, uh, even bigger than uh, Burkina Faso and the other countries, is that uh, uh, there is a place called the uh, Agadez in northern area where uh, where uh, the, the, there is a military station uh, for the US, and they are uh, they are now losing this place because. Uh, they cannot control the people. Uh, they cannot control the people when they still have this, uh, uh, you know, when these things are being taken away from them, sorry. Uh, it is very, very important to understand that uh, uh, with, with them losing power to control uh, uh, these uh, regions or these uh, resources like uranium in uh, Niger, it will be very, very difficult for them to to fund the economy. Uh, you see, uh, for example, uh, you see, for example, in uh, uh, people started demonstrating uh, last, that was last week, uh, no, last month, for the last one month, for the French troops to withdraw their troops uh, from Niger, which uh, Macron was vehemently denying that he cannot. In fact, the French ambassador was the, under house arrest. He couldn't leave the, the embassy in Niger because they were adamant, uh, uh, you know, they were adamant for keeping their rule in Niger. They had to even smuggle food from France, croissants and whatnot, and people were intercepting this. It was late until last week when Macron decided to finally let uh you know the troops from uh the french troops to you know evacuate from france this is a big step uh towards the end of imperialism in uh in uh, in uh, that region of the country and it is a big step uh for what happened in burkina faso because uh, uh there's a threat from uh the economic uh block of west africa called the ECOWAS which uh, is threatening them with a military intervention. And uh, it's very encouraging to see that these uh, countries are coming together. 
to form a military alliance to fight these imperialist uh, uh, collaborators. Uh, when uh, what's important to see in uh, in uh, the colonial times and what is happening now is that these imperialist countries cannot fight. You know they cannot bring their troops directly. Their new tactic is to use their collaborators to fight other African nations to seem like you know. Uh, uh, to uh, to find some very skewed reason to justify their causes, just like uh, you know the 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 the, uh, the Kenyan government now is being used to fight a proxy war in, in Haiti. That's what is being uh, is uh, happening in Niger over there. That's what is happening in the Congo over there because the uh, the collaborating troops are being sent to, in the in the in the pretext of peacekeeping. But uh, it's really, really a foreign war to the people. Uh, all this to maintain control of minerals and to maintain control of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Western uh, the Western policies of capitalism. But uh, I'm now going to talk about what we need to do as socialists because yes, we have this change going on. Yes, we have now. Uh, you know, there's some awakening in Africa, but uh, do we really, really support uh, blindly every coup that is happening in Africa? We need to take a stand as social, a revolutionary socialist all over Africa and understand that the oppression in Africa is not a racial oppression, as some of the revolutionaries in Africa as uh, have made to uh, have, have been made to believe, you know, that uh, there is a white man somewhere who is out to get us. Uh, we need to understand that the conditions of Africa are as bad as, uh, you know, everywhere in the world, and it has nothing to do with race. It is very important to understand that this is a class war. And when, uh, you know, uh, there's this uh, black consciousness movement that is coming up now, supporting these schools and uh, calling for every overthrowing of every uh, g uh, government, which is a good thing. Uh, now that people know that they, there is a necessity for change, but we as revolutionary socialists, uh, uh, we should condemn every reactionary coup that is taking place. We have to uh, understand that the people are the ones that we support. The people need to come together and form, uh, you know, uh, 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 communes and committees, and uh, if the if the incoming coup, uh, coups and the coup leaders are yes imperialists and most uh, truth be told most of these military jun juntas at best they are just anti imperialists to the core they are nothing like socialists uh, mainly they will just take power and maintain the control of resources now by them but not by uh, the french or the british or the portuguese uh, influence this is very sad because uh, it's a reformist at best, uh, but the fundamental uh, issues of uh, capitalistic oppressions are still there to the core. It is very important to understand that the revolutionary socialists support, uh, you know, anti-imperialist cause, but we do not support the junta just because it's there. We need. Uh, we are writing like uh, we discussed at the Congress. We have to, our resolution is supporting the people, and the people need to come together under a socialist banner. Even if we are overthrowing the French, is one part of it. It's just the superstructure. The base of it should be overthrowing the system. Uh, countries like Burkina Faso have a very very uh, rich history of socialism. Uh, for those who read about uh, Thomas Ankara in the 1980s, was a very socialist, progressive reader who lead, who led Burkina Faso for uh, you know in a revolution in 80, 86, 85, but was killed four years later. But by one of his people, uh, of course, supported by the French, and uh, you know the revolt of the people built up and uh, which led to the coup in 2021, installing a. Uh, Abraham Traore as the leader, uh, you know, that can be a very good thing because they have a socialist background, uh, which Sankara built. It is very easy for them to pick up from them. Like any, but countries like uh, Niger have never had really 
socialist uh, leaders in the past. Uh, they can only look up to socialist organizations there and the people need to come together to find a socialist solution to these problems. Of course, there are uh, imperialist power, new imperialist powers coming in now. And uh, yes, China and uh, Russia, who are very, very much interested in the cake that Africa has to offer. They understand that most African states do not have... Uh, you know, strong military uh, equipment to fight the 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 you know this imperialist. That's why it's very important uh, for them for these new regimes that are, are taking over power to seek alliances with Russia and China, and uh, uh, groups like Wagner are very are very much benefiting from this because they have vast access to minerals that Africa has to offer. Uh, you know, so uh, we, the people of Africa, do we really, really support uh, these things? Because uh, we can't replace uh, uh, we can't replace one uh, imperialist power with another imperialist power. We need to find our homegrown solution to home uh, to the problems that we face, and we believe that the the solutions that we face uh, can only be solved by uh, tackling the class struggle and uh, uh, doing away with the capitalism that is the scourge uh, that is going on. Because uh, if we cannot take a charge of the minerals that we have, it will always be, you know, the poverty problem, the hunger problem, the, you know, uh, lack of basic needs problem that almost all African countries uh, have. Where during the Congress, uh, you know, almost all uh, countries that were present uh, talked about the, you know, most countries cannot afford basic needs. And it uh, really stems from uh, the advent of colonialism and, uh, you know, uh, the capitalism taking root in this uh, stage of Africa. But we are very, very optimistic now, uh, now that these things are, uh, are happening, uh, more about socialism is being talked about all over Africa. You know, uh, uh, socialist organiza organizations are springing up all over Africa, in West Africa, in East Africa, in South Africa, everywhere in Africa. You know, there's this message of uh, the anti-colonial campaign, which can be a build up to a socialist culture in Africa. When you talk about uh, revolutionary Pan-Africanism, and he talked about this in the Congress, we said that uh, we we talked about uh, you know a socialist Africa, uh, and that should be the essence of this schools. Uh, what we are talking about, they should be anchored on the analysis of socialism, because uh, uh, you know uh, in Sudan, for example, now there's a civil war going on, and of course uh, President Ruto in Kenya is being. Uh, uh, tasked in heading the negotiations and the warring groups have, of course, uh, one of the warring groups have refused to accept him as their negotiator because he's a puppet of the West. He's being sent by Biden there. And uh, there was a coup in Sudan in 2020 years. Uh, I, we had wrote about this sometimes back. It stemmed from the general strike of all the workers, which was a very important uh, coup in 2020. But this was thwarted because there were no subjective conditions. The people were not ready and power fell back to the in the hands of the military. And now it's becoming a vicious cycle. We need uh, to take advantage of these situations and uh, build strong revolutionary organizations. And uh, we are very, very happy because the, uh, you know, uh, the link that most, uh, comrades now can join the ISL is a huge stepping stone in bringing revolutionary organizations in Africa together under the banner of socialism to uh, take over power in the future and change the course of the working class people of Africa. We look forward and we will be writing more in future about as these things uh, you know, uh, unfold because oh, there have been military scares when uh, African presidents now travel to uh, general assemblies and whatnots, you hear of scares that uh, the back home people want to take power. There was a 
in Central African Republic, uh, when there was a general assembly two weeks ago, there were reports that, you know, some people have taken power, which were actually false. But I know more will come because it's a cycle and it's a spring that will rise. And we need to be, uh, our analysis needs to be very, very scientific. And our support for these coups can only be, uh, you know, uh, support uh, and in an imperialist way. But we advocate for a socialist solution to these problems. I don't want to take much of your time and uh, because it's very late here in Kenya also, it's 1 a.m. And uh, uh, thank you guys for this. And uh, we hope to uh, talk more in the future. Gracias. I am delayed, no problem. Thank you, Erra. Esther. Thank you, Esra. Esther, can you hear Esther? us? You there? Yeah. Up. yeah. Good evening, comrades. Um, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. And um, I'd like to first state that we are very much excited about um, this collaboration with the ISO and especially our participation in the conference in Kenya. That um, before then, we thought that um, our struggles were limited to Ghana and West Africa. But then um, when we took part in the conference, we have learned a lot from other comrades and we know that our struggles are similar. And so um, it's very important and it's very crucial that we build that international collaboration so that we help stamp out some of these rooted issues that we, we are facing here in Ghana and in West Africa. Um, I would like to go straight to the struggles of women here in Ghana because um, we know that yes, we have a lot of issues affecting the country, but then when it comes to women, our issues are, are more overt and we, uh, the struggle, the oppression of women is so evident here in Ghana. I would like to first talk about patriarchy, that um, it needs to be stressed that the exploitation and the oppression appear in the material sphere of production. And then these are perpetuated in the social, political, cultural, and the moral elements within the superstructure. And so the families, the states, the civil societies are those ones, part of the superstructure that help to maintain the status quo and the exploitation and oppression of women. And in fact, we are talking about patriarchy in the sense that now the social relations reflected in the social production in society where um, the uh, family, women's role are limited in domestic work and the men's role are rather highly elevated in society. And so historically, we know that patriarchy has been founded on the soul and personal property of the father as compared to communal living and the right to inheritance. So it is within this family where the father has assumed the role of the head of the family and the women are just subordinate workers. And um, this has persisted today, even in today where most countries are civilized. In that context, you see that the gender or stereotypical roles are still evident here in Ghana. So the man is the head and the woman is the subordinate. And that is the issue that we have with patriarchy. And so irrespective of the educational background, the wealth, the capabilities, the strength of a woman, he or she has to be a subordinate to the woman. So women are less weaker when it comes to, I mean, women are weak 
and men are rather strong. And so society promotes the welfare of men more than women here in Ghana because of the rules that patriarchy has actually brought upon us. And then when it comes to class struggle, uh, Ghana is not left out. Even though women are part of the active social force, and of course, working class women forming the largest group of this active social force, there is no doubt that the biggest challenge which face working women is how to navigate our career opportunities, whilst also maximizing motherhood. And so um, class struggle is, is, is here. Uh, exploitation and oppression are perpetrated within the economic sphere, especially because you know that capitalist economy organizes itself around production and labor processes where the work of women differ from men. And so in this sexual division of labor, there is a hierarchy where a woman's, a man's work is of higher value than that of a woman. And so because of this, this structure, which has divided the, the gender roles, where a woman's work is less valued, there is that separation between production and production and reproduction. And so capitalist production only considers labor in the production sphere to be work, work in that context, while relating it to production. So a woman is supposed to give birth, take care of their family, and that kind of domestic work in Ghana here is not recognized or it's not valued. So cooking for the children, cooking for the husband, um, take, doing cleanups, those domestic roles are not really valued here in Ghana. And so um, the men's own, get up, go to office, work, bring money, that is what is valued in Ghana. So that, that is a big challenge. And I mean, this kind of stereotype is really affecting us here. And so it does not even encourage the women to aspire higher. So a young girl dreams of, okay, I'll go to school, get married, come in and, and, and stay home. We, we are not aspired to go higher. And that is a big challenge. We are just hiding our potentials. Then I'd like to also talk about some of the social cultural struggles. Um, right from infancy, throughout womanhood to agedhood, Women face a lot, a lot of challenges. And um, one is child marriage. When I talk about child marriage, I'm referring to the situation where girls below the right marriageable age of 18 are forced by situations and conditions of society into marriage. And it happens so much in the northern part of the country. So you, in, if you go to the north, about um, four out of 10 girls get married even before they turn age 13, even against their will. And um, when you question their parents, they will always attribute it to poverty. So yes, poverty is, is very evident here in Ghana, but should that be an excuse where young girls will be forced into marriage? And so these girls are deprived of bright future. I mean, a young girl getting married and being forced to give birth, how is that definitely is going to affect her health, is going to affect her outlook and everything. So um, in terms of poverty, parents will rather focus on taking care of the boys and leave the girls. And once they give the girls out in marriage, in Ghana, we have what you call the dowry. The dowry is what the parents receive from their spouse or the man as payment on the girl's head. So that money is a form of profit for even the family. And so they feel that giving out the give, give, trading the girls in marriage is also a way of making profit for themselves. And it's also a way of helping um, overcome their poverty. So that that is is very barbaric, but then um, it's, it's it's really going on. Then very terrible situation that young girls face is what we call the trocracy. 
This is rooted in cultural and religious beliefs of their people within certain communities in the country. Um, when we talk about chocracy, it's, it's a local term and it simply means that a slave of the God. You know, in Ghana, we still have the traditional African religion very dominant in the country. And so there is the belief in divinity. So it is believed that some families have offended the gods. And so in order to pacify the gods and to stop calamities upon the communities, girls from the families are selected to go and serve the fetish priest. It results in the fact that the girls, these young girls, these small girls, end up being married to the fetish priest. And that is where they spend their livelihood. They don't come back home. They stay in the shrines. So they spend all their lifetime there being married to fetish priests and they are denied of their dignity. We have what we call witches camp here in Ghana. <laughs> um, it's uh, people, we, want, we all want to grow old and have a, digni a dignified life. But people in certain parts of the communities in Ghana here are even afraid to grow old because once they start exhibiting certain um, health conditions like dementia, like menop menopause, then society or those communities begin to tag those old women as witches, witches who are bringing misfortunes to the community. In fact, recently, in the past three years, a couple of old women have been battered and murdered after being called witches. And nobody, no, no organization, not even government was able to rescue those women. They have, they have died cruelly. And the reason given by the, those communities is that the women, those old women are witches. They have caused misfortune to the society. In fact, um, some organizations, some of us are trying our best to help influence government to come out with policies to abolish this kind of barbaric calling women or old women witches. Some who are able to escape are kept at the camp and at the camp they live in hearts. Okay, the hearts are made of mud. That is where they live. They don't have proper shelter. About 50 to 100 are kept in one hut. No access to food, no access to uh, basic needs. It's, they just depend on few organizations who go there to visit them. Up to now, government has not been able to come up with policies to abolish this kind of thing. And old women, are those facing this. Women at the age of 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years have to go through this in their own country, in Ghana. Now, I would like to talk about the issue of domestic violence. Domestic violence is very prevalent here in Ghana. And um, it's, it's very, we, we have it prominent in our news today that a man would just get up and kill his wife on, on a report of alleged cheating. A boyfriend would just get up and batter the girlfriend on alleged cheating. So physical violence, murder, rape, uh, penetration of um, women with objects against their will are some of the domestic violence abuses that women face. Some are unable to report because of fear of being stigmatized. Others have the courage to report, but then some of the issues are just thrown away at the court. It, 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 I mean, we, women do not get the justice that they need when they go, when they suffer these forms of domestic violence. And also sexual abuse is a big problem. And um, we also have that issue of um, 
we also have issue of sexual abuse where um, women are raped and yet they are unable to seek justice. They can't even talk about it. Then we have economic challenges as well. You know that yes, in Africa, we have that issue with poverty, but when it comes to women, it's, it's, it's on the highest level. Even though we contribute a lot to the labor force, almost every woman is doing her best to engage in some form of petty trading, some form of subsistence farming, so that they can feed themselves and their families. But when it comes to properly paid jobs, so many women do not get access. One is because of their lack of um, education to a certain level, because some of the jobs require a certain kind of qualification. And because um, some women do not have access to that kind of qualification, they are also denied that job. So we find a lot of women on the streets engaging and hawking, and they are prone to sexual abuse, they are prone to accidents. And um, we also have women who also take agriculture upon themselves so that at least they can grow food to feed their families. But then they also are saddled with the challenge of lack of access to farmlands. So yes, they need the lands to work, but then because of the right to a uh, patriarchy and that patrilineal kind of society that we have here in Ghana, women do not have access to lands easily. Even if they can afford, it's difficult for them. And so some of them have become tenants. So they depend on the kind of farms that their husbands have, their uncles have, the heads of the family, the male heads of the family have to grow the little food. And so they are unable to do large scale farming, mechanized farming, so that at least they can make a lot of money to be able to cater for themselves. And um, finally, I would like to also talk about um, underrepresentation. We wish that so many women are pushed to leadership roles so that with the power, they can influence society, they can influence policies in order to help get to some of the problems that we have been facing. But then we still have issue with underrepresentation. Sometimes um, when women buy for positions, society comes to criticize them. I mean, because women have been subordinated for so long that society does not wish that they assume the leadership role because um, to them of what value or of what sense will a woman be the head or be a leader whilst men have to succumb to a woman's leadership. And so a lot of men do not even receive support so that they can aspire to become political leaders. In parliament, for instance, in Ghana here, we have 275 seats. Out of the 275, we have only 35 women representatives. 35 out of the 275 parliamentarians. Only 35 are made up of women. And even these women um, in parliament, unfortunately, they are unable to use that influence because their party forces them to rather represent their, their interests, the interests of the parties, and not the interests of women as a whole. Um, last, in the previous election, um, the major opposition party nominated a woman to be an aspiring vice president. And the, the party lost power. And I know that it was because a woman was selected because people were not ready to vote for a woman, for a party that has a woman as a vice president. And so the party lost. The, 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 not, excuse me to say the uncivilized argument was that what at all will a woman bring to the table? A woman's role is limited to the home. And so that is where women should focus attention on. So um, these are some of the struggles of women. They are so tense, they are so difficult, they are so rooted in cultural, religious, 
political beliefs so much so that it's been difficult for us to rise and fight to kettle or to stamp these struggles out. And so um, we are very much happy and hopeful that this kind of um, collaboration with our comrades in other countries will help us will help us build a stronger force so that we can help come out with certain um, ways of influencing our culture here, influencing certain ideologies, influencing certain policies through protests, through writing, through um, media broadcasts so that we can help change our story and our narrative as women here in Ghana. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Esther. Bueno, ahora si está... Thank you, Esther. And if Venezia is here as well, you can go ahead. Bueno, ahora... Venezia, you're muted. Now, Venezia from Malawi. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Sí, perfect. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's such a great honor. And I'd like to extend my gratitude, thanking you guys for, especially the Congress that I attended in Kenya. Uh, it's been very insightful. And I brought home so much knowledge and I sat down with my comrades to impact the knowledge on our fellow student leaders so they could disseminate the information to students in general, young people. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak to uh, at this point. Um, yeah, uh, so let me quickly go straight to um, the struggles. I'm going to talk about the struggles that women face because I'm also a gender activist. Um, I'm working with the Malawi National Students Union, and I was privileged uh, to be given the opportunity to be part of the Manasu Strategic Plan Committee. So at least I have like incorporated gender equality in it. So we'll be doing certain activities to promote gender equality amongst students, uh, young people in the country, across the country. So um, I'm glad my comrade mentioned uh, earlier, Esther, that um, it's interesting how African countries have similar struggles, like our struggles are just the same. So most of the challenges that women in Ghana face is the same as um, the challenges that women in Malawi face as well. So mainly it's the patriarchal hierarchy, the patriarchal beliefs and the gender stereotypes that the society just termed women inferior. And to an extent that women themselves don't even believe in themselves, believe that they are capable, which is a very huge challenge, in fact, because women do not support each other here in Malawi. Um, I'm gonna give you a very practical example of myself uh, because I'm the former student union president of the Catholic University of Malawi. And I was the first female student, but it wasn't easy even during my campaign to see that women did not even believe in me. So they did not support me. I actually got most of the support from the men. So it's really a huge challenge how women themselves don't tend to believe in themselves here in the country. And um, just to add on to that is also the misconceptions about feminism in the country, 
uh, it's really posing a huge challenge as well because feminism is not just about women, but then when most men hear about feminism, they think it's just has everything to do with women, women empowerment. They feel like we're challenging them. There's a whole country of it. It's, it's, they do not understand the term. And several times I've tried to explain to my friends. And the sad thing is that even the intellectuals, these are student leaders we're talking about. We have like a group of young student leaders from different universities, like all the universities, public and private institutions in Malawi. And they still do not understand what feminism is all about. It's about empowering both men and women. So they just don't get the fact that it goes both ways. And they still believe that um, feminism is brought by the Westerners and um, it's not African. That is what they say. And so they, it's, it's hard for them to promote um, gender equality. Or, and this is a young generation we're talking about. If we have to change, it starts with the young generation. Education is the main catalyst for change, this social change. And if the intellectuals themselves, they do not understand, I think we have a huge challenge there. So yeah, those are the kind of the challenges that we are facing. The people do not still understand. I think we need to do more campaigns on the awareness, educating the people, really just try to make them understand the concept much. Really, and my comrade has really said a lot. And another thing, but I'll still talk about it just to put emphasis on it. Let me just stress that point uh, of uh, early child marriages. Um, that one also is one of the main huge challenges like in, that women or girls are facing in Malawi because Malawi is one of the countries with the highest um, rate of early child marriages and um, I think because I also did a research my dissertation my research was on early child marriages and after my research I found out that um, now the cases have gone down not because early child marriage is not there but because now people are not reporting see they are the chiefs, the traditional leaders working hand in hand with the police. They try to bring back the children that have been sold. And now that people are aware that it's a violation of human rights and they're being arrested for that, they get to pay the chiefs so that they do not report them to the police and they still sell their children. And then people think the cases have gone down, but it's just because people are not reporting. So I think there's still a lot that needs to be done regarding early child marriages. The policies are there, the awareness campaigns, but unfortunately um, now maybe because of the poverty aspect that people are not able to take care of their children and they still believe that uh, a girl child is just meant to be maybe a housewife they even prefer to send the male child, like the boys, to school than the the girl child. So it's still in them. Like it's still in a lot of um, people in the rural areas that uh, they're still selling their children, but it's just taking a different dimension. Like people think the cases have gone down. People are fully aware. They are aware, but they're just not reporting now that they know they are being um, um, charges are being pressed if they are found doing that. And another thing is um, sexual harassment in schools and workplaces. That is also another issue. And um, the challenge there is just the reporting mechanism uh, because most girls they feel if they report, they are not protected. Like there's no any other protection. They feel like they there's no any other confidential kind of way of reporting. 
to still guarantee them their safety if they report maybe their lecturers or their bosses they fear for their jobs their school their grades and things like that so that's also a huge challenge but um uh different schools have come up with a um, um uh, gender harassment policy in different institutions especially higher learning uh, institutions like the universities so um, at least a lot is being done on that there are several uh, interventions policies regarding that so maybe hopefully uh, we are going to see results in the near future maybe the cases of uh, harassment um um, intimate partner, um, I mean, wife, uh, girlfriend battering, the gender-based violence where you find uh, boyfriends beating their girlfriends in schools and universities. We have got also high cases of uh, such cases, situations here in the country. And uh, another issue, uh, this takes me to employment opportunities as well. Um, women, uh, girls in general, they are deprived of economic opportunities, uh, which makes them also more vulnerable to uh, gender-based violence because they're not economically empowered and then they are being abused because they have nowhere else to go, they are not educated. If they, that's, that's even why they don't, some of them don't report their husbands. If they beat them up, sometimes you still find cases there's the lots of cases that maybe a woman has been killed by her own husband because maybe he was beating her up, things like that. But you, if you follow the story, you find out that maybe it started maybe some time back, but she just wasn't voicing it out because, hey, that's the husband and um, he's doing everything, supporting her financially. She just has no choice but to stick around, which... Um, makes her maybe end up losing her life. It's really a sad situation here in Malawi. And another unfortunate part is um, the agriculture sector. Women are involved in the agriculture sector. They are very hardworking. They do most of their agricultural activities, but they do not have access to land. And if they earn money, it's their husbands who control the income. So they are still women in general are facing those kind of challenges to send maybe their children to school that is why they just end up maybe selling their children some of the women here in the country so that's mostly about it so gender inequality affects it's really cross-cutting like you'd find even in the technological aspects you find that most women are not technologically advanced because of the same patriarchal beliefs um thinking that oh, okay this is something the gender roles that you know they have also they've just been put in place like women are supposed to do this men are supposed to do science subjects engineering and technology is for, and even on social media, if women are on social media, they're not protected, they're bullied and things like that. So women really need that um, social protection. They need to be protected. They need to feel safe. And also before I forget another thing, especially in the universities, like recently we had a meeting uh, general Assembly, like the Manasu General Assembly. So uh, and quite a number of issues were raised regarding uh, uh, problems that students are facing in general, especially women or ladies. And it had been noted that most schools, like most universities in Malawi, do not have enough hostels to accommodate uh, most ladies on campus. So they have to operate like from a distance. Then most of them are not sleeping on campus. They have to operate from a distance and some of them, they're staying late studying in the library till maybe around 10-ish PM, which is very late and it's unsafe for, the, for ladies. And then they get raped. Some of them get killed. 
these are the issues, the challenges that women are facing in general because it's women. Most men, when they see women, they just take advantage of them. They feel, oh, this, this is a, an inferior class. So they can just attack them anyhow. But they're not considered as in priority in the schools, whether they need to put all the ladies on campus and maybe that's not considered. They are just left to um, sort out their issues on their own, which is very bad for most of the ladies here in the country. And um, moving on to the next issue of, uh, uh, oh, my friend mentioned about um, a certain cultural, traditional, certain culture that I think she mentioned about how they have to pay to their gods and whatnot. I think that's very similar to, we also have like a culture here that's called Kuyota Fumbi. So when a lady, when a young girl comes of age, they do like an initiation ceremony where they tell her about how she's now of age and how she's supposed to handle a man and then they give her a man so that they just it's like just like an initiation ceremony so it's really bad it was condemned it's been condemned but um as i was doing my research uh my dissertation um i was told by some of the chiefs that th some of these uh initiation ceremonies do still happen they still take place in the rural areas so it's still there like i said it's just about people are not reporting they still believe it's this strong, it's just deep rooted. They still believe that uh, that has to be done so that they can, you know, prepare the, the young girl for uh, marriage, which doesn't even make sense. They're, they're very, very young and they have to go to school and probably maybe stay in school for maybe another 10 to 15 years in school. And then they say they are preparing them for marriage, like at that tender age, it does not even make sense. It's very, very, very sad. Um, it's a sad situation really here in Malawi. So yeah, Malawi has been hit by uh, several challenges, climate change, but as an organization, our organization, we're really trying to combat the climate change effects, the planting more trees. So as we are still, we're still working on our strategic plan on how we can combat the challenges, the gender challenges, the climate challenges. And um, of course, um, representation, okay. Leadership, uh, decision-making, obviously it's a challenge. If a woman is bullied, imagine, a lady spends a night preparing for her manifesto. The moment she walks up, like she wakes up, she's on stage just to give her manifesto as in she's contesting for maybe a, to be a student union president. And then the guys start bullying her. They tell her, no, turn around. We have to see your back first to see what you see. Those are the kind of things that um, ladies are really facing. Like this is just a very, a practical example that's really happening in public universities for that matter you see so it's really a challenge people still believe that women cannot lead they are not given that opportunity to experience uh, to like earn gain some leadership skills so it's very it's a great challenge we have uh, campaigns like 50 50 campaign here in malawi that's trying to uh, balance maybe the numbers of um, the participation of women in maybe parliament, but uh, it's still not yielding results. It's not very significant. Um, yes, the awareness is there, but ladies just don't want to get into politics. They don't want to get into decision-making tables. I don't know, maybe it's the support is not there. Ladies are not really given that platform to um, reach their highest potential. If, if you could begin to wrap up, that'd be good. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Right. Thanks. Um, anyway, let me just conclude by saying um, the challenges are real and that I think, I believe in a collective action. 
um, sharing ideas, like working hand in hand, collaborating and doing the campaigns, talks, or maybe using social media just to spread the awareness using dramas, writings, articles, that will really go a long way in, you know, shaping the future of our continent regarding gender parity. Yes, so looking forward to that and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Venezia. Thank you, Para Venezia. The idea is to open a round of questions. There's already questions in the chat, but we're going to open for taking questions from the floor here, and then we'll go to closing statements. So whoever has questions can raise your hand. And you come up to the table to make your question here in the microphone. Meanwhile, we will read some questions from the chat. First is, in Ghana, is the religion mainly a Muslim Islam? Another comrade says Ezra's a contribution on analyzing the coups is very interesting because it goes into the relation between the mass movement and the leaderships to be able to intervene in reality. Another comrade says that the struggle is a class struggle, but the gender inequality cannot be denied. What Comrade Esther was saying is terrifying. Those levels of inequality that exist simply for being women. Another of the comments says that the problems that were presented by both comrades is terrible. The political struggle in that context has an element of heroism that is enormous, the work that you guys do there. I haven't seen any raised hands. Okay, there's a comrade. Brief question. So the question is around the level of consciousness of the mass mass movement there. What's what's the level of consciousness and the crisis of representation that it's the army that ends up being at the head of the mass movements? So is there is consciousness shifting to the left in Africa or or no? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have heard you. My question has to do about the first thing Ezra was talking about. The other comrades eh, interventions were very strong at things we didn't know. But I wanted to ask about this struggle between the US and Chinese imperialism. How has Africa how has China advanced in Africa in in the struggle for the resources in Africa? You know, China has advanced economically on Africa, but how is China operating in Africa these days. I wanted to ask about, with everything that's been happening, with the coups, the fall of regimes, 
with the rebellions against France. How has the left been responding to these uh, anti-imperialist movements against French imperialism? How, how has the left positioned itself? My question for the comrades is listening to you. I think there is there are points in common in the gender struggles in Argentina and other places. But how much do you guys know of the advances of the feminist movement in this part of the world? And how do you think the feminist struggle can continue advancing in, in Africa? Any other questions? My question is brief and concise. In the Congress held in Africa, what's what's what measures were taken or what was voted to advance the struggle against hunger and poverty in the continent and everything that was discussed in the women's inequality and everything the comrades shared about their their country and all the plunder of minerals but what my, that was my question what what did the congress resolve to do buenas yo quería hacer una pregunta de una compañera no se animó a pasar eh what is the what's the situation with uh, with farming and the uh, agrarian question with the uh, desertification and uh, ecological problems and second question about NGOs that here that role that here that role is played by center left parties that challenge us for organizing activists is it then did I understand right that in Africa NGOs play that role, and these are NGOs linked to like U.S. imperialism or. Alguna preguntita más, Augusto. No, mi pregunta o mi inquietud después de escucharlo al compañero es que independientemente de las organizaciones políticas que acá se mencionaron, si existe en el terreno exclusivamente sindical algún tipo de organización independiente, eh, puede ser... Is there any independent labor unions, whether they be bureaucratic or not? Are there labor unions in which we can intervene? Are there women's organizations or movements? 
that fight against all these things you were talking about? La situación por la que pasan las mujeres eh, es sumamente catastrófica. The situation of women that you were telling is catastrophic. También pasamos por muchas situaciones y creo que nada se compara a lo que hasta hoy. And here we have many problems as well, but I think it's un, not comparable to the things you were talking about. Algunas cosas vemos que pareciera algo tan lejano y hoy escucharlo acá tan cerca. Things we can, we may have seen in a documentary or something we read, but hearing you talk about it, it seems so much closer. So it, the question is, are there feminist or women's organizations and movements that fight against these things? Bueno, leemos eh, algunas de las preguntas que están en el chat y pasamos Some a questions from the chat. Compañeras y de los compañeros. Uno, uno plantea que en un momento Ezra mencionó que el imperialismo ya no tiene la capacidad de intervenir Ezra said de forma directa en el poder. Uh, imperialism can no longer intervene directly with their militaries. Why is that? Another one, what is what role does a evangelical religious institutions, churches, and what impact does that have on gender and women's problems? Are there any self-organization uh, processes? If you can say something about the uh, health system in relation to women as well. And what 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 do you uh, see when you see the French people also fighting against their government? Last question. La intervención de Ezra mencionó como una de las limitaciones el tribalismo para el panafricanismo y quería preguntar qué medidas se pueden tomar, porque por ejemplo si tomamos el ejemplo de Congo, cuando tenemos la figura de Patrice Lumumba que proponía eso, después hay todo un conflicto muy intenso entre Ruanda, Congo, los Tutsi y los Hutus, y entonces cómo, cómo se puede combatir eso en caminos. ¿Cómo podemos luchar contra el eh, tribal problem that Ezra was referring to the 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 struggles Estamos like we la, have seen around Rwanda and different places? What what can we do about that? Para organizarnos, Fede, eh, a general eh, Esther, closing. If Esther could close eh, responding to some of the issue, the questions and then Ezra can close. We can do a shorter closing statements. Obviously, respond not about the questions on women and on the rest of the questions, whatever you want to close eh, about, and then Ezra. Can we do that? Esther, can you Esther, can you hear us? Yes, I, yes, I can. Um, Okay, so um, is Islam the most dominant religion in Ghana? No, Islam is not the most dominant religion in Ghana. The most dominant religion is Christianity. But um, when you, um, geographically, Islam is dominant in the northern part of the country. And Christianity is dominant in the southern part of the country. Then the African traditional religion is across the country. But in general, or on the whole, Christianity is the most dominant religion. Okay, our level of consciousness towards the left, I would say that it's on the low, taking the whole population into consideration. So if you pick the whole population of Ghana, not so many people are conscious towards the left. And um, you don't blame us because the kind of education that we have here in our country is modeled towards the West. And so even the curriculum, the syllabus do not offer opportunities for 
the young ones or students to know more about the left. Okay, so it's just um, a few people who find themselves in progressive movements who have the opportunity to know more about the left, but on the whole, the country is leaned towards the right. Um, the right. Yes, we are, Ghana is more pro Western. China in Africa, yes, there is um, high presence of China in Ghana and in West Africa now. You can see a lot of their private businesses operating across the country, um, manufacturing basic needs like sanitary pads, toiletries, and they have most of their malls and their restaurants too are owned by Chinese companies. And I think it's easier for them because it's easier for private companies in China to secure loans from their exim, export import banks in order to establish themselves here in Africa. And even the mines, if you, if, if you look at the mines too, you see a lot of Chinese businesses operating in our mines as well. So there is high level of Chinese presence here. We even have um, foreign uh, Chinese military bases here in West Africa. And normally their presence here has been enabled through the granting of loans, um, giving out foreign aid, giving out grants to our government. So it's very easy for China to, I mean, China presence here is, is high. Okay, um, feminist struggle. Yes, feminist struggle is continuous, but we have snippets of groups or smaller groups who are trying to, um, for a um, feminist group actually, who are trying to promote the rights of women through sensitization, through um, awareness creation, and um, through influencing of policies. Yes, inequality, like I already talked about, there, there is high level of inequality between men and women. And I've given the background, the background reason. The situation with um, desertification and ecology, ecology. Okay, so just brief. In, we, we have Savannah region, we have the middle belt to be more of forest and uh, having a lot of the forest. And um, that is where organ um, organization, private corporations get the timber from. Timber is controlled by government, but you know, people find a way to engage in illegal logging. And um, once they cut off the trees, they do not replace them. So there is, we have the problem of deforestation here at the moment. And that is what these peasant farmers are facing. Climate change resulting from the fact that the trees or the logs fell are not replaced. And it's really affecting their farming um, occupation in those areas. Okay, so currently we don't have any political party that is leftist. The party that led Ghana into independence, that is Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's party, it's known as, it's not, it's known as the CPP, Convention People's Party. It's traded on the part, it was on the part of um, socialism. But then when his party was overthrown, when Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown, series of Cool details followed. And um, since then, that party has not been able to gather itself. It's almost at the verge of collapsing. And so currently, we have a lot of parties, like over 16 parties. None of them is really, we can't say that a party is really leftist. The major opposition party, known as the National Democratic Congress, um, is says it's a social democrat, but then its operation is more of a capitalist when it is it's in power. So we don't have a leftist party. We have just um, a few, a few, a very few minute percentage of progressive um, organizations, but then 
um, we are not unified. Each organization is trying to do its own thing, if I should put it that way. We have the labor union. We have the trades union congress. That is um, the TUC, which has unified all the labor movements. But then the operations is more of capitalist or rightist. It's, they are not really focused on the leftist ideology. So that is also a big challenge. Sometimes when drivers union have issues, and so they go on to demonstrate, there's that allegation that their leaders accept um, favors from government. And so at the end of the day, their, 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 their apprehensions and their problems are quashed. Their, the government does not solve their problems because of the kind of leadership that they have in terms of the labor movement. Okay, so um, religious groups and the impact on women's struggles, I will say that sometimes some of the religions are rather helping deepen the wounds of um, of women or of the struggles of women because um, I they haven't been able to overcome the, their patriarchal um, teachings, if I should put it that way. Then the health system, that is a big issue. There is high rates of maternal death as well as infant mortality because access to health care is a big challenge in the country as a whole. And when it comes to women, it's worse. Um, just this week, government is taking out subsidies on dialysis. Dialysis is already costly in the country. And government is taking away subsidies because it will benefit or those um, those companies, it, it will benefit those companies, those capitalist companies, those bourgeois companies. Almost every, all the drugs are sold and uh, we don't have access to, like when, when women are pregnant, they are going to deliver, they have to pay you sums of money. Even though the country, we, we all pay taxes, we pay tax on, insurance we have the national health insurance scheme but it's it, it doesn't really work we buy almost every drug access to health care is is a big challenge for women drugs are very expensive so sometimes people prefer to stay home and see if they can try the drugs the, the herbs okay in order to cater for themselves because health care is is very expensive it's very very expensive for the working class it's rather the bourgeois class that's able to access proper, proper health care, not the working class. Okay, I, I think most of the questions have addressed them and Ezra will also answer some of the ones I, will, I couldn't uh, talk about. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias, Esther. Thank you so much, Esther. Okay, thank you, and Esther. Now, and now, uh, Ezra, can Ezra, you, you can um, answer the question and, questions and questions. make your final report Ezra, as well. Ezra, are you there with us? Can you hear us? Yes, comrade. I uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, Perfecto. Very late. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there were several, I hope you guys can hear me. There were several questions that were raised uh, that are very important. And it's very, very uh, good to see that uh, people uh, were very attentive and listened to what uh, the comrades said. Uh, there was a very interesting co question from one of the comrades who asked uh, that... Uh, uh, what's the level of consciousness of uh, of the people? I th uh, it's very important because I talked about this when I was in uh, in uh, when I was in Argentina. It was very important to 
address this because sorry my phone is misbehaving a little bit because i have to look at the question and uh, uh let me let me put it back sorry uh, sorry okay uh yes uh good uh so uh the level of consciousness of the people of africa because of the divide and rule that uh, has been uh, meted upon the people of Africa, their level of consciousness to political issue is deliberately being, being kept low so that the control of the people is made easier by this government. Uh, when I see uh, campaigns uh, going on in Argentina and the issues that are being raised in Argentina versus, for example, Kenya, uh, the, uh, the issues are being trivialized to tribalism. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, put this question and uh, merge it with the, the comrade who talked about tribalism in Africa. Uh, uh, it is a secondary issue that is being peddled as the primary source of conflict of the people of Africa. In Kenya, especially in Nigeria, uh, elections are basically won by the biggest tribes in the world, uh, in, in their countries, and nothing to do with uh, what really the leaders stand for. Uh, and it's deliberately being kept this way so that uh, rule can be kept in the hands of these bourgeois uh, nationalists. It is very important uh, for each and every revolutionary comrade to understand the national question. For example, in Kenya, the national question, if we understand the national question in Kenya, we can solve and make class struggle our primary source of struggle so that we can overcome the issue of tribalism, for example, because the ruling class has really benefited from it since independence till now. Uh, people majorly vote are based on uh, the essence of tribe. It is really an issue. Uh, when you talked about the uh, genocide in Rwanda, you see, it was politically uh, driven and uh, led to the death of uh, almost the massacre and alienation, annihilation of a whole tribe because of political reasons uh, for just um, a few elites to keep their power. Uh, it is very important for comrades to understand that uh, the ruling class and the bourgeois capitalists used this uh, thing to blind the people and make it easier for them to rule. And they're taking advantage of uh, this lack of consciousness to to uh, exact their rule uh, uh, to the people. Uh, well, I'm also going to talk about uh, uh, the US and Chinese and Russian imperialism. Uh, one comrade had asked about that. Um, of course, uh, now that we have other powers developing, uh, the US and uh, China, uh, the, the Russia and China are real uh, new imperialist powers coming in. Uh, it is very confusing because the Chinese are coming in as, you know, communists. And uh, uh, this has brought a lot of confusion amongst the left. Uh, of course, they are giving out loans you know, uh, they're coming up with this huge infrastructural problem, uh, 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 infrastructural uh, projects. Uh, for those who came to Kenya, who we'll see the expressway built by the Chinese, a lot of things being done by the Chinese. It is uh, very important to understand that imperialism is imperialism. But uh, in the face of the U.S. imperialism, most uh, organizations that are leftists in Kenya have chosen to side with uh, the Chinese. Uh, this is a danger because uh, as much as uh, they're coming to compete and, you know, uh, the, their level of uh, imperialism cannot be compared to these other uh, traditional imperialists, we need to be very careful. And this uh, requires even further debate amongst us Africans. And uh, Comrade uh, Imran uh, is really uh, uh, well versed with these things and we might even organize a forum here in Africa to discuss this. Uh, but it's very imp uh, we need to be very careful because we cannot just support them blindly. And we know uh, these kind of loans and uh, the way 
uh, the austerity that they bring and the strings attached that uh, these loans comes with. So uh, yes, the, uh, these coups uh, that are happening, uh, China and Russia especially, are uh, also uh, in the mix because this uh, new military juntas that are anti the traditional imperialists are coming in. You know, Russia is coming in to step in and sub. Like you know, we are the good guys. You know, look at us now. Uh, leave these other guys, but we need to be very careful uh, in the long run because uh, they are also interested in the minerals that have been uh, their source of conflict for all these years since uh, the partition of Africa in 1895. Uh, another comrade asked about the hunger campaign in the Congress. We There was a suggestion that uh, this be taken further and, uh, you know, expanding the, you know, this uh, hunger campaign to other organizations in Africa because uh, these are very uh, important things, and uh, these are things that affect all organizations in most countries in Africa. So, for example, uh, the Tanzanian comrades couldn't attend uh, today's uh, meeting, but uh, that's one of the countries that's very, very agrarian in nature. And when one comrade asked about ecological problems in Africa, uh, it's very, very much directly uh, related to capitalism because, uh, as Esther talked about, logging in West Africa, uh, there's a lot of deforestation uh, happening in uh, East Africa and uh, especially Central Africa, where there's a very, very deep Congo forest is a very, one of the biggest rainforests in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, mercenaries and imperialist powers have taken over these forests uh, where it's deep in minerals and deep in uh, uh, deep in minerals and uh, sorry, deep in minerals and uh, and trees where they are logging to 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 because uh, most of this even some of these imperialist powers do not even believe in uh, in climate change. So uh, the ecological justice. Uh, a wing of the RSL, for example, uh, has campaigns against logging, has campaigns against taking over, you know, uh, in Nairobi, the main uh, things that happen is taking over land and building uh, structures. And, uh, you know, so what we can do is having campaigns to reclaim this uh, land, but we need more action on this. And uh, when you talked about uh, NGOs, uh, that was very, very a uh, true analysis because yes, we have a lot of uh, ecological groups that are coming over, and in the name of NGOs. And uh, when we pick, when we go back to what I said before, the main problem of Africa is the lack of basic needs. So it is very easy for people to form organizations in the name of uh, NGOs, you know, uh, again, uh, to provide sanitary towels to women, uh, eco, uh, climate change NGOs. But in real life, these NGOs are here to mint money from unions and to benefit a few people in, uh, you know, because uh, there's a deep analysis that we did about NGO discourse in Africa, here in Kenya. And we realized that you know, even the, the structure of these NGOs are capitalistic and bureaucratic in nature. And uh, when the money comes from the donors, who are mainly from these imperialist countries, it will just reach the top uh, management of these NGOs. And uh, the rest of the people organizing uh, will not have a chance to to to, to real change. So this these NGOs organization NGOs organizations are revolutionaries. We understand their limits, and we understand how uh, this can be a very big impediment to true uh, change. Because uh, people like uh, us, when we go to uh, organize the people in uh, in in the informal settlements and whatnot, uh, they think we are NGOs and they expect money from us. Uh, it's very hard. It, actually, NGOs, it must be a topic that we can discuss in future because they are very, very uh, uh, huge influence in the leftist politics in Africa. 
and they have taken over, uh, you know, uh, organizing, which was a very deliberate attempt with the advent of neoliberalism in Africa. Uh, another question was the labor unions. Uh, the labor unions largely are co-opted, which is very different from what I saw in Argentina uh, when I came to visit. The labor unions in Africa are largely pro-government. In fact, in Kenya, the leader of the trade unions is a very, very big collaborator of the government. But all is not lost because we are, uh, have a new campaign of forming grassroots uh, pro-workers unions. For example, me and my some of my progressive colleagues have formed a union just a few, three months ago called the Progressive Tech Workers Union. Uh, which seeks to uh, bring together all workers in the tech industry. In, in, so far, we are just in Nairobi. It's very small. But this is a right a step in the right direction where young people understand that, you know, the strength in organizing in labor. So uh, all in all, we can say that we are far behind in true uh, achieving the true uh, labor unions that are progressive and pro-workers. But, you know, we can start where we are and uh, you know, see the gains and lay a foundation in future revolu uh, revolutionary and progressive trade unions. Um, uh, another comrade talked about indirect military rule. Uh, indirect military rule, uh, why the imperialists are using uh, proxies to fight their wars. Yeah, uh, it's a continuation of uh, of it's a continuation of what they used to do in the colonial times. For example, uh, they used not to send uh, their, you know, they come directly, but they divide you guys. For example, in Kenya, they, they, what they're doing in Haiti, they know uh, that the people of Haiti cannot accept them there directly. So they're sending, they're using the race uh, thing. For example, they're sending black people there people who look like the Haitians, to fight uh, an imperialist war. It's a, it's a very, uh, it's a, it's proved to work for them. And uh, it's a very sad because uh, uh, in Kenya, for example, uh, Kenya now is fighting three wars. Uh, they have some soldiers in Congo. They have some soldiers in Somalia. And now the police are being sent to, um, to Haiti. These are things that we need to fight against. Because uh, uh, if we continue to 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 stay to to conform to these imperialist uh, countries, uh, even uh, to be very hard for you know liberation and true pan Africanism, because uh, they are using black uh, people to fight other black people. I know uh, it sounds ridiculous, but it really works for them. Uh, but it's a continuation of the colonial system in direct rule. Uh, Esther talked about religion and women. Uh, it's, uh, I don't want to add more about that because religion is uh, played a very, very huge part in uh, Africa. Uh, almost 99% of Africans are religious in one way or na another. And uh, you know, women are in the center part of it. Uh, and we need to talk about this more, uh, you know, how we can liberate them and how we can use uh, progressive uh, means of organizing and tactical ways to even uh, turn these uh, religious people into their progressive struggle. Uh, I think the, those are the main things that were asked. I'm sorry if... Uh, I didn't catch a question. There was a question that was asked that, uh, very fast that passed me, but I hope it was answered by uh, Comrade Desta. Thank you uh, for listening to us. Uh, and uh, we want to take this opportunity to uh, really appreciate the comrades of the ISN uh, for really, really taking the chance and uh, looking in the matters of expanding the re revolution in its internationalist aspect uh, to ensure the permanence of the revolution. Uh, we, comrades of Africa, uh, you know, want this to work because we believe uh, 
uh, uh, we need uh, the revolution in Africa more than any other place because uh, the inequalities in Africa are worse than any other place in the world, it, you know, more than most parts of the world. And uh, we need the revolution more than anything else. And that's why we need this internationalist uh, agenda. We need an internationalist aspect of the ISL that comes in here now to push this forward. Uh, Trotsky talked about uh, the revolution in its permanence. We need to come together as a people uh, of Africa under socialism. When you talk about uh, 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 when you talk about revolutionary Pan Africanism, we are bringing together uh, small young organizations that are very Pan African, that are very revolutionary in nature, with a very young cadership to uh, you know build together a new dimension of a uh, true revolutionary left because yeah, in Africa, it's very hard to organize mainly because even the leftist organizations have been co-opted by this bureaucracy and NGO mentality, uh, which are, are at best just uh, reformist in nature. Uh, so uh, be patient with uh, us and uh, sooner or later we will build a very, very big and revolutionary African wing of the International Socialist League. Uh, we wish you well uh, in all comrades uh, over there, especially the comrades in Argentina, Celeste, and all the comrades over there in the elections. Uh, it's a true testament that uh, even the true revolutionaries can be had and can you know, uh, have some gains in uh, the elections. Thank you, and we look forward to having more debates. Thank you, and uh, have a good evening, and have a good night. Yeah. Para, para, ir, para cerrar, una pregunta. There's one question. If we consider that there is a, a shift to the left in Africa, I think we should not attempt to simplify something that can't be simplified. I think in Africa there is a process of rebellion that comes from last from a decade ago that has not uh, been cut. We have we don't have enough information. We know little about this. That's why our next magazine will be entirely about Africa, which we should finish by the end of the month. Because people know very little about Africa. The rebellions of Northern Africa, which I think we should consider them revolutions, had the working class at the forefront. It was general strikes. The general strike was the main tool of the of those revolutions. Egypt has one of the strongest working class. That didn't finish in a victory overall because the military came back and recomposed itself. But that process didn't wasn't halted. It was continued in other places. The whole process now against French imperialism is a continuation of that. Our French comrades and think there's there's a kind of new May May of '68, a new French May in the in the last few years. That's why it's no coincidence that the political tools being built in France and that we are coming together with the revolutionary wing of the NPA there. So I think there's a process of accumulation of strength. And I think what is most important is that there is a young vanguard that is beginning of to turn left and looking for an alternative. And we're seeing this in every country. The phenomenon in Kenya might be the most advanced because they organize hundreds of comrades. They're going towards their uh, founding Congress. End of the year, beginning of the year, 
the RSL will have its first Congress, but it is a organization of young cadres of Ezra's age, we're not 30 yet. And that same process is what we saw in the Congress that is happening also in other countries. For example, the comrades of Ghana, who are dozens of comrades, who beginning with the problem of patriarchy and the disasters of society against women, have advanced in building an organization, a socialist organization. And it is also a generation of young cadres, I guess, there, who have a very interesting work that they're doing. In Zambia, which the comrades aren't here, they are, they participate in elections and they had, they had like 15% of, of the vote. It's a young, also a group of young people at the head of that. In the universities is where we're seeing this process of accumulation is beginning. How long does that take to reach the labor movement? I don't know, it also depends on what we do. What can we do to help them build organizations, political organizations that can reach the working class? That would be impossible if that vanguard didn't exist. That vanguard exists. We see that it's general in Africa, it's everywhere. And our challenge is how do we merge with them and help them build revolutionary parties in a process that is very open. All the comrades that came to the Pan-African Congress are, are members of organizations. Some of them are already in a more political stage, like Kenya, Zambia, some other places. Some are student organizations, organizations that are coming out of the university, and also around women's issue, which I think it's a problem, it's a superior problem than what we have in, in, in the West. You know, they face bigger problems that we don't, we don't have here. So it, it's no coincidence that women are at the vanguard of the struggles there as well. So I think we are before a huge opportunity and at the same time, with a tremendous challenge because it's a complex place which a tremendous inequality where hunger is is the, the main, comrades main campaign is 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 against hunger so the the social pressures of all ngos and others are tremendous because they operate to disarticulate uh, organizations of people so that people instead of organizing a revolutionary organization channel all that energy towards these NGOs. So this is a, a very smart, a perverse policy of imperialism because they corrupt everything. Now in that whole framework, in every country we're seeing a young vanguard a rising and open to new ideas of organizing and looking for alternatives. And I think from there, that can evolve towards building revolutionary political parties. In Kenya, the comrades organize up to 2,000 people. Many of those, the leaders came from the Communist Party and they, they left and they took all of the youth of the Communist Party at that point. Now that process is more extended and not just in Africa. You see our comrades in Lebanon, for example, all around the same age as, as Ezra, also comrades that uh, began in the Communist Party and broke with the Communist Party around some of the same debates. You know, if China is communist, if China is the alternative, the Communist parties that have had a tremendous strength today, they're in a process of complete decomposition because what they propose as an alternative is not the Soviet Union. It's the imperialist China and Russia that sends these mercenaries, these fascist mercenaries to replace the traditional armies. So there's a vacuum there. There's an open space where we can pose our alternative. And we have the possibility of transforming 
helping transform these groups, these foundational groups into revolutionary organizations, part of a revolutionary international that can be a the beginning of a focus of revolution. I'll finish with this. Western Sahara is the last full colony in Africa. We've talked about semi-colonies, which have a lot of elements of colonization. But the layer of young activists, militants that came out of uh, Western Sahara are taking over the leadership of the Polisario Front, which has been the, the party army government of Western Sahara that has been fighting against the occupation of Morocco. The youths that are going to take over that leadership are the ones that are organizing with us. And we, we fight it. We compete with Stalinism for those youths that will be leading the Polisario Front. We can become a, a, a point of organization for all those people. That vanguard can advance towards revolutionization. This is the opportunity we have and the challenge we have. I say challenge because we are weak for the opportunities we have, for the tremendous opportunities we have. And that is where I appeal to the young cadres of our different organizations of the ISL that in the next coming period will have to play an important role. Also, taking the step of taking their experience from here and helping out in another country. I think we need to build incredibly internationalist organizations. And this is going to be fundamental for building national organizations. Because from the experience of building this is where we have to train the cadres of our different parties for the coming period. To close, the most important part of the Congress is that we made a call and organizations from of different kinds from 14 countries came. I think if we hold a Congress in one year, 30 can come. The challenge we have is our limitations. What can we do to take advantage of the opportunities? And also what we can learn because what, as you saw, the quality of the cadres that we saw here have a lot of contribution to enrich our own organizations and our international to bring these cadres on board and to contribute to the organization of tomorrow that we need. So thank you to the comrades who have stayed up late to talk to us 